Michael DeBakey was an American cardiovascular surgeon. He was born in the States, but his parents came from Lebanon. DeBakey was educated at Tulane University, and he pioneered surgical procedures on the heart. And he became a world specialist as a heart surgeon. It earned him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is really the highest honor bestowed on a civilian. One day, Dr. DeBakey took his car into the garage to be serviced. There was a rude mechanic. He spotted him and he said disrespectfully, Dr. DeBakey, you aren't the only doctor today in the shop. Oh. He said, are you a doctor? He said, yes, I am. Do you know what I do? I also do open heart surgery. I take valves out and change them, just like you do. But they're car engines, not people. And then you know what I do? He said, I put in new plugs. I change the head gaskets. And I put in new parts, like you do. We basically do the same work. Dr. Abakey listened to him. And then he said, I suppose we do. But working on car engines, I do it when the engine is running. James was the first preacher in the early church. He was a pastor. And he decided to write them a letter. And he wrote them the letter when all their engines were running. Jewish Christians, in that day, they were bruised with adversity. They were hunted. They were persecuted. And this happened by the Roman Emperor Claudius. He was a real jerk. He was kind of a minnow swimming in deep water. These Jews, they lost their homes. They lost their homeland. They also had another enemy, Gentiles, who hated them because they were Jews. And by fellow Jews, who hated them because they were now Christians. So James, this spiritual surgeon, he immediately steps in sends him a letter and he goes to work. Attitudes. They had been fractured and disjointed. He set them in a new cast. Spirits. Bruised, blistered. He wrapped them in new bindings. Shakespeare, he knew what James was facing. He wrote, a wretched soul is man bruised with adversity. Well, these new Christians, on the run, they needed a special surgeon. Is there anyone out there that's listening to me who hasn't faced what James has faced? Job did. Here's what he said, man is short-lived and he's full of turmoil. Job 14.1. Listen to David's words. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Psalm 34, 19. Paul went even further. We are afflicted in every way, perplexed, persecuted, and we're struck down. 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Paul was a wounded deer, running from the hunter, leaving a bloody trail behind him. What about you? Have you faced any of these trials? Have you gone through an unfaithful marriage? Maybe you've just come through a crippling accident and now you need a crutch. Someone close to you that you love just passed away and now there's a deep, deep sorrow. You've been climbing the corporate ladder. 
And once you got near the top, the rung broke and you fell all the way to the bottom. And there you are, still at the bottom. What about those cutting remarks that they said to you and they left you bleeding? And you kept bleeding on the inside. Those cuts, those burns, those spills leave painful emotional welts. Well, James knew that. His opening words leaves no doubt. He said, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Verse 2 of chapter 1. The word various that he uses is a very interesting term. Do you know what it means in English? Polka dot. Our lives are polka dotted. Shattered with trials of all shapes and sizes. And you can't avoid them. Then James tells you what the purpose of all that is. Why you have to face them. Here's what he says. Verse 3 and 4. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And when endurance is finished with you, the result is perfect, and it's complete, and it doesn't lack a thing. Human nature has an enemy, and the worst enemy that it can face is cruelty. Do you remember what the Golden Rule teaches? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It doesn't work. Don't anybody tell you that. We humans are wired just to do the opposite. Nowhere is it more clear than if you're applying it to suffering. We don't want to suffer. As a matter of fact, we get a lot of pleasure from others who have misfortunes. Have you ever heard of the word Schadenfreude? It's a German word. And it means enjoyment obtained from the troubles of others. It comes from two nouns. The first noun is Schaden. It means to damage or harm. And the second noun is Freude, meaning joy. Don't you feel just a tiny little thrill when your enemy is taken down a bit? And you look at that self-righteous hypocrite and you see that he's exposed? Doesn't that do you good? In today's political discourse, it's a common weakness, but we've now made it a virtue. We love celebrating ways to inflict pain on one another. Listen to how a politician tears apart his opponent and puts him down. We can use nicknames, insults, mockery, we can become downright vulgar just to inflict pain, a pain rather, on somebody else. That other person's transgression has been turned into an art form for you. Just listen to the rhetoric going on in all these political campaigns that you're listening to. Why is it when cruelty is on display that we love it so much? What makes us at a rally laugh and cheer at some disabled individual? Ethnic groups different from us. Poor hungry immigrants like you were years ago. It's been said and rightly so. Cruelty is part of human nature. When you share cruelty to a crowd, they rejoice and they just lap it up and they shout it back in triumph and celebration. So what's the answer? Well, it's not remain silent. James doesn't tell his congregation remain silent. If you remain silent and you allow that poison to continue, that will spread all through the nation 
and it'll destroy the nation's soul. Like me. Didn't you learn from your mom and from your dad and from your teachers at school not to bully others, but to report bullies? Learn to stand up to them. Build people up, said James. Don't tear them down. Your Bible instructs you, you shall not oppress a stranger. For you knew the heart of that stranger, having yourselves been a stranger in the land. Exodus 23, 19. Love the stranger, the Bible says, as yourself. Leviticus 19, 34. These words are repeated 30 times in the Old Testament. In our culture, Cruelty makes witnesses afraid to stand up. It's easy to be enveloped in a cloud of shame. When you see somebody that opposes hate and you do nothing, when that happens, our social fabric frays and then all of us are at risk. That's what James says. Do you know what the word testing means that James uses? I'll explain it to you. It comes from the Greek word dokamos. It means approval, verse 3 of chapter 1. If you're an archaeologist and you're doing a dig in ancient Greece, chances are you're going to unearth some ancient piece of pottery. Could be a bowl, might be a vase might be a precious piece of cookware. And on the underside of your discovery is a word imprinted by the potter, and it's the word dokamos, approved by the maker. The symbol meant that the piece had gone through the furnace, and it now has no more blemish. And James is saying that you and I we're vessels. We've been created in God's image, and we've gone through the fire, and we're now mature. No cracks. Fully approved. God put his stamp of approval on you. Trials produce endurance. That's what the verse 4 says. Testing brings about maturity. That's God's ultimate purpose that he has for us in our lives. Now watch what James does in this letter. No one knows how many received the letter. Nobody knows where this letter was sent. And we don't know who read it. But we do know when they received the, the letter, all their engines were running. In verse 12 of this first chapter, James is going to give them an energy drink. It'd be the equivalent today, probably, of our Red Bull. I'll read it for you. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those that love him. James tells these early Christians they're going to receive a promise. And it's going to be a crown. But something away off, something that they're going to receive in heaven one day? No, that's not it. That's not what he's saying. That's not what James is promising. The crown that James is talking about is a crown right now. Something that we can enjoy with the engines running. If you heard the word crown during James' time, it had four meanings. The Greek word was the word stephanos, which meant crown. Here are the implications that a person could associate when he hears that. One, a crown of flowers was worn at the time of joy, maybe when a baby was born. Happiness and festive joy took place, but it could have been a crown worn by the bride on her wedding day. That was the crown of flowers. Two, 
maybe it was a crown made by or worn by kings. And that was a mark of royalty. It was a sign that he was in the authority of his nation. There's a third one. It was a crown of laurel leaves. And it was a gold medal in the Olympic Games. And it was the victor's crown. He came first in the 100-yard dash, so he wore that. The final crown is what James is talking about. It's a mark of honor. And it's really a sign of dignity. This last crown is what James is talking about. It means royalty. You have become a prince or you've become a princess because you're a child of God and you are given victory which others can't win. Only you can win it. It means you have met life head on with all of its discouragements and all of its demands and you have conquered because of the presence and the company of your Lord Jesus Christ. He has obtained new dignity for you. Remember, no man can ever be worthless if Christ died for him. Nietzsche said it best. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. James' words were even better. When you know the why of your adversity, you can now choose to grow through them. Peter. He was just a shy little boy in grade three. He also came from a poor family. And he often arrived at class hungry. He and his mother were homeless. And it was Thanksgiving time. And the teacher asked the class to draw a picture depicting the Thanksgiving theme. And she told the children, maybe it could be a turkey that you're going to draw, or a pumpkin, maybe a golden leaf, bowl of cranberries, maybe the pilgrim's top dark hat. Could be the boat they came over on, maybe the Mayflower. Each student was given a sheet of art paper and some colored crayons. And when the pictures were drawn, each student had to show up front, in front of the class, a presentation of what they drew. When all the pictures were completed, the teacher came to the front of the class and she displayed all the works. One by one, as she held up the pitch, they would come up and describe what they had and what they did. The class interpreted each presentation. When Peter's turn came, he came forward and he held up his paper and when he did, the class just giggled. On his sheet, he had drawn a simple hand and an arm outstretched. That was his Thanksgiving gift. Well, the teacher quickly took control. And she said to the class, Peter, in this picture, must be thankful for something. Before he tells us what it is, let's us try and guess. What do you think Peter is saying with this picture? One by one came the answers. Well, it's a policeman's hand. He's helping somebody. Another one said, nope, it's a fireman. He's just come from putting the hose back in the truck. Another one said, no, it's a doctor's hand. He's going to put a bandage on the sore. Another one said, no, it's the preacher's hand. He's holding it up to seek forgiveness for somebody. Everyone guessed. Finally, the teacher turned to Peter and said, Peter, whose hand did you draw? Peter paused. And then he looked at the teacher. And he said to her, Teacher, it's your hand that I drew. Again, the class just giggled. And they derided Peter's comment. And then Peter spoke again. 
He said, do you remember at recess when I was all alone in the field behind the baseball diamond under the tree? Nobody played with me. There wasn't one person on the whole field at recess that even cared about me. I sat there by myself all alone. And then you came. And you came and found me. And you took my hand. And when you took my hand, you didn't let go. You told me what nobody else said. You told me that you liked me. And that one day when I grew up, others are going to like me too. Your hand that I drew, I'm thankful because I'm not scared anymore. In verse 16 of James, chapter 1, James holds the hands of all his followers. And in his letter, with these words, he tells them, don't be scared anymore. Dear friends, don't be thrown off the course. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes to you from heaven. Your loyalty and love for God is going to be your reward for life. Isn't this fellow James, the preacher, way back there in that first century, an amazing man? Well, next week when you come back, there's a lot more there I want to show you. And there's a lot more we're going to learn together. See you then.